This is a podcast from the Nuffield Department of Medicine. Today we are talking to Dr. Frank Warren Delft, who will tell us about how he uses x-rays for drug discovery. Hi Frank. So can you tell us about how x-rays are currently used to develop new drugs? Well, the amazing thing about x-ray crystallography is that you get an extremely detailed picture of the the protein molecules you want to look at, literally the position of every atom. Mm -hmm. And this has been recognized for decades that this is actually an opportunity to design molecules that would bind exactly to the pocket you want to. Because you see every atom and you could also actually visualize in 3D the positions of the atoms of the compound that has to bind or that could bind, you can model in principle exactly where it sits. So that's been the ambition of crystallography all along. In practice it's much more complicated and the computational techniques to do this prediction don't really exist or aren't really mature yet. But um, nevertheless industry and crystallographers in the industry have latched onto this a uh, long time ago, mm-hmm. have really pushed very hard to integrate the crystallogra- crystallography ob- observing compounds in the structure with the chemists and the biologists that do the tests to have an ecosystem of developing compounds that works very well. And they've been at the forefront of pushing the field of crystallography, high throughput approaches, very quick turnaround of structures so they can go and tell the chemists what molecules to make. So how does your research group's approach differ? So, so about maybe two decades ago, people started thinking, can we be much more rational about the process of developing a compound? Rather than discovering by looking at libraries of millions of compounds, could we take much smaller compounds, which they call fragments, it's as if you fragment the mm-hmm. drug, and see how they bind to the protein. Um, and then when you've seen the binding, you can go tell your chemist, well, there's an opportunity in this side of the pocket, you can go build something or go build out there. Um, so these are called fragment-based approaches. The problem is that these fragments, because they're so small, also bind very weakly. Mm -hmm. So you actually have to observe them in a crystal, in a structure. And um, simply testing them by biophysical techniques won't really work. Um, So um, initially people would try and do crystal structures of every compound. Turned out to be really a lot of work. And they then backed off and said, well, let's pre-screen these fragment libraries. We're talking about a few thousand Mm -hmm. compounds by by biophysical techniques biophysical techniques and then you can go and weed them out if you found the ones that bind you can go look at their structure and um, build on that. Now actually the crystallographic experiment is by far the most sensitive way to see binding so you'd really like to do your primary screening crystallography. So uh, we set out to try and change an experiment which would take months literally to do a few hundred compounds into a matter of days to do hundreds or thousands of compounds at the crystal structure experiment. How are you working to achieve uh, these sorts of aims? So we're talking about the big logistical experiment and clearly this is a job that needs geeks and engineers as well. So we decided to partner with Diamond Light Source, which is Oxfordshire's own big science facility right down near Didcot. Mm-hmm. And um, so to, to combine the medicinal chemistry skills available here at the university and, and our extensive experience with this big facility. So I took charge of one of the experimental stations, we call them beamlines, which are serving the whole UK community of crystallographers. And this one was built uh, with in mind having high throughput um, and increasing the capacity of of uh, crystallography in the UK. So we went to partner with them and said, let's develop this experiment um, at this beamline. And so I've now can draw on two groups, my group here in Oxford and the group at at Diamond, which is a very, very talented set of individuals. Mm. We've looked at all steps of the process from sample preparation all the way to data collection and just to, as I said, shrink the process. So we've got robotic sample mounting, we've got new compound collections and we've configured the beamline so that you can just put 500 crystals into the beamline and it will go overnight, just collect on its Mm. own, something which had to be manually supervised can will just happen automatically. What are the most important lines of research that have emerged over the past, say, five to ten years? So in this field, I'd distinguish two. One is this idea that you can use fragment-based approaches to have this ultra-rational drug design process, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. it's really feasible to go from something extremely weak, which most chemists would dismiss, would have dismissed in the past, and then actually build up um, in steps to come up with a really potent molecule. And this has been shown to work and it's now, it's been a quiet revolution. It's been gradually adopted as a standard part of the toolkit of all medicinal chemists. I think that's a big deal and it's not really recognized as such. And then on the other side, on the crystallographic side, this experiment has been transformed in the last two decades. Two decades. The intensity of, of uh, x-rays has, has gone up massively with at synchrotrons. The detector technology, we can now contemplate 
to do an experiment about two orders of magnitude faster than we could before, something which would take 20 minutes, now takes less than a minute to measure. Mm. The software available has become so powerful and so easy to use that we can deploy it for hundreds of analyses rather than one by one painstakingly. And also robotics or sample handling that have really changed it. So the fact that we can even contemplate doing 500 experiments in 24 hours, never mind that we can actually do it, is astonishing in its own. Mm. Why does this line of research matter? Why should we put money into it? So molecules that bind potently to some target, some protein, turn out to be extremely powerful research tools for in a basic research and also clinical or preclinical research. Mm -hmm. So in fact, these molecules, you can go look at their citation numbers and they will have citations that rival the top researchers in the world. So, but the other problem is they're very rare and they're very expensive to make. Mm. So. If we look, look at what happened with the human genome in the 90s, when it was really hard to sequence one gene and suddenly there was a transformation because mm. of technology and they said, oh, hang on, we can actually do the whole genome. Mm. We need the same thing with molecules. We have a few molecules, we need to start thinking, how would we actually get molecules against every one of the 20,000 proteins in our body? So that is, it's some, it's, it, we need to transform the technologies to actually transform the imagination available around the research. How does your work fit into translational medicine within the department? So it's well recognized that the big problem with drug discovery is knowing which targets to work on. Mm -hmm. And this is not actually a problem of economics or the pharmaceutical industry. It's a problem with the patients. The patients are the ones that don't have treatments, effect, effective treatments for the diseases. So if you're going to start validating the targets, you're going to need these, research, these molecules, these research tools. If you're going to get the research tools, you're going to get, have to get much better at developing them, mm -hmm. which includes getting much faster at the design of this. Now, it's not just about generating molecules. It's about testing them, the whole ecosystem of developing them. So I'm working very closely with several colleagues at the SGC, at the TDI, on the computational and the chemical and the assay uh, technologies that are involved. People like Paul Brennan, Brian Marsden, Nicola Burgess-Brown, Oleg mm -hmm. Fedorov to see how we can um, really transform the process. The, the medium term goal really is to make a molecule a go-to technology rather than something that you may aspire to eventually. I see. Well, thank you, Frank. That was extremely interesting. Thanks.